I think the, um, the power of being able to see something in action uh, really does speak for itself. And so uh, the school was very committed to this. Once we'd made a theoretical um, uh, search of the kind of pedagogy that we were looking for and had found a partner school which happened to be in Melbourne, Australia, then it was obviously going to be crucial for us if we were going to make this successful to get staff out to see it. So we had to see it in action and had to get to the heart of, uh, of what made this thing work. And so the school was very committed and we've sent a number of staff out to Australia uh, over a number of years to actually see this and to refine our thinking. And equally, uh, the school had to commit uh, some of its budget to bringing expertise into the school. So on three occasions, we've brought the principal from the school that we were working with in Australia into our school to act as an international critical friend and to look specifically at the work we're doing and the progress we're making. So that was a key principle, that we knew that teachers were going to need those exemplars internationally uh, from a place where it had worked successfully. The second phase of that is to use internal exemplars, that we have a lot of open coaching sessions between staff. And that's very important at all sorts of levels, both in terms of seeing something take place within the classroom and seeing how our children respond and then transferring that back to a different year group. So if we can just backpedal into where reception are now, because they're two or three years ahead of you in terms of thinking through those problems, Lisa, what... How is it panning out? I know it's very different, isn't it, for the children there? Because, because of the stage of their development as well. Yes. Um, so currently in reception, um, during learning agreement time, the children um, have access to the continuous provision that's provided in the unit. They can access um, any sort of learning experiences that they're interested in. So then we would talk to the children about what their current understandings are and plan some more activities in curriculum time. So there's like a link over from learning agreement yeah. time into um, curriculum time as well. So it's not they're not too separate. Do you get that sense of there's still a bit of a division between the one and the um, other? Well, for example, we've put out uh, some boxes and things and some books because our science topic is sound, but we've put yeah. this out in the learning agreement time. Yes. And then our project is to use the flip video cameras to look at the ideas about sound, film, what Brilliant. they've been making. So we're trying to bridge the gap between the curriculum and learning agreement Great. time. Yeah. I think that's really key because what you're doing is you're allowing that learning agreement time activity to bleed naturally into the rest of the curriculum time. But I still think we're probably going to need to structure some more support around making that happen in staff's mind, around the planning, uh, and also in the children's mind as well. I think that's something worth looking at. And also because of the level of family engagement we still have in Year 2, um, it, it's just a fantastic resource to actually then use parents and guide them maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Because one of the big issues is always there aren't enough staff, yes. there aren't enough adults yeah. to help facilitate yeah. it and, and work it. Yeah. So because the parents are so used to coming in, I mean, the parents in year two have been coming in now, this is their third year. Yes. So maybe we, we could do some coaching and actually develop the parents more Definitely. and more. That model of coaching and um, teachers helping other teachers like me to develop what they're doing and reflect on their practice, I think has also reflected on the children and has really helped them to discuss their own learning and to reflect on that themselves. OK, so we've been doing this project for all of this week so far and we're just going to do a bit of reflecting on what you've done. So how well do you think you've managed to stick to the plan that you made? Well, we could have made it better because on day one we didn't practice, we didn't do what we should have, then we had to run into day two, and then we had like only a little bit of time to do day two, and then it, and we still haven't done much of the props, we still need to do a few more props and stuff. So this way of working is obviously very different to how I trained on my PGCE, which was based a lot more around the primary strategy model, so it's been a real challenge to to adapt to this way of working really. I think it would be very easy to drift into quite a woolly way of, of working and it's a real challenge all the time to make sure that you're getting that, that rigour into it while still letting the children have the freedom to do what they want to do. One of the questions that could be levelled at a system of negotiated learning is, does it address the standards agenda? And for us, 
a crucial understanding, and it is absolutely crucial to the success uh, of a venture like this, is that if you capture a child's passion and you ensure that the structures you're putting in place don't get in the way of that passion, so then actually that, that drives the standards agenda. Being able to wrap the learning outcomes around that passion to make sure that the learning outcomes that the government would want us to address meet that child's passion. If we can get that combination of those two things, then that drives standards. Because really what you end up with is children that are incredibly motivated because they're studying things that they would like to study. The third and really important and, and maybe uh, the, the cement that joins it all together approach was around coaching. So we brought in uh, a coaching expert that worked with all members of staff at all levels within the school to make sure that as a staff body we had a guiding principle of how we were going to talk with each other and how we were going to push the standards agenda on both in terms of quality teaching and quality learning. Right, children, this morning you've all done learning agreement time. Think about when you did your learning journey, what did you choose to do? Where did you choose to go and learn? And I'd like you to tell your partner, where did you learn today and what did you learn? Off you go. Of course, there is one element that is very much part of negotiated learning, which actually makes the deployment of staff and the success of that whole approach to learning work. And that's the role of the child. And so absolutely vital to that process was talking to the children and saying, how is this working for you? And what elements of this are exciting and motivate you about your learning? And which elements of this are still getting in the way or inhibiting your learning? I filmed Jamie and I filmed Taylor. You filmed Jamie and you filmed Taylor. We're going to watch the video in a little second, that, um, or one of the videos that Remy did. Remy, not all of the children have used flip video yet. Could you tell them what they'd have to remember? If they chose to do flip video tomorrow, could you tell them what they'd have to learn to do to use the flip video? What would they have to do? Uh, you press the red button, then it films, then, then press the red button again, then press the arrow, then it films back. So we'll watch the film and then we'll ask um, Remy some more questions. We're doing this um, uh, story and we're doing on this Google Docs. It's like stored in, uh, in the cloud because uh, it's not saved in your little computer but right. it's saved somewhere else where you can go at home, at a library or um, at school. Um, you can go wherever you've got a computer. If you, if you, if you have wireless, then um, you can go on Google Docs. And um, I'm doing a story about Finger in the Magic Pot. I haven't really finished it yet, but I can imagine what I'm going to do. Um, the fun thing about... For the children in this school, this way of working has become the norm. So it's very much the case that they're passionate about their learning and they expect to bring that passion to their learning. I find it more interesting and like, I think I like learn more when I like it. Why do you learn more when you like it? Because I'm more focused on it. They expect to be steering and co-constructing the curriculum. I think it makes me feel a bit like that you like, can trust me like, to just go off and do it and it makes me feel kind of like I'm um, grown up. That may create a problem as they go into secondary schooling. I really hope it does. I really hope it moves that agenda on and agitates a change driven by the children. Trust my son and uh, be independent and go off and do it. You're not kind of rushed to do it. You can just perfect it. Because if anything is going to be required in the 21st century, it's going to be that the children themselves are driving the learning. If they then act as a catalyst for change, how fantastic.